some of the reasons that our results are elite, like we've never been above 1% in delinquency. We've always been really quick with service requests. Last month, we answered 5,300 phone calls and we only missed 24 of those by answering on the second ring. A lot of these metrics that are really, really elite is because we manage the properties by building out work streams of specialists and not generalists. I think every multifamily operator out there, property management company owner, whoever just is constantly bitching about how hard it is to find good help, right? Especially on the maintenance side, especially on the construction side. What does that process look like for you guys as it relates to hiring either techs or, or you know, for example, rent tech one, rent tech twos, crew chiefs, et cetera, blue collar positions, folks that are getting in the unit actually swinging hammers. Do you have some special sauce there that um, that's enabled you to help scale that side of the business? I love this question. I'm super passionate about this answer too. So uh, we've taken a very, different approach than most people. Uh, most people in my industry are going to hire somebody that are already skilled, that already have it, and they're going to pay them a lot of money because you need to. There's just not a lot of trade people, like you said. Yeah. Uh, we took a different approach. Instead of spending, we could have spent a lot of money and hired people that already had the skills. Instead, we took a lot of money and we spent the time creating a tech school, a university, and really put a lot of money into development and training programs within our company. And then we hired people with very little skill. And we hired people with great attitude, you know, great work ethic, and honestly, people that would consistently show up. And it's so interesting, right? You could pay, you know, $40,000 and go to a tech school to learn some of this stuff, or we can pay you like forty to $50,000 and we can teach you this stuff. And we just really spent a ton of money on like these training programs and these trainers so that we could bring people into our company and do all the training. Now, don't get me wrong. We have licensed plumbers and electricians and, and general contractors. So, you know, over time, obviously we bought some of that, but 75% of our company, I would say, especially in the construction work center came with very, very little. And we would do things like this, right? If you're a service tech, like we're going to train you on all the basics. You know, for example, in Wisconsin right now, it's really hot and humid. So we just know that when an AC goes out, we need to make sure that all of our techs knows the top five ways to troubleshoot an AC before we just get a new one, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure that our service techs can change a garbage disposal and, you know, put in a toilet, like basic plumbing things too. But they probably aren't going to know how to change out a furnace. Uh, they probably aren't going to be able to put in a water heater. We would call that a service tech too. And if you are in the top 25 percentile of all service techs and you've worked at our company for over six months and you, and we, we can measure this, right? Cause we have the scoreboards. Well, then you become eligible if you'd like to become a service tech too. And you click a button on our learning management system and it gives you all these classes. And now you get to learn by reading the steps and watching the videos of what it's like to have a certification too for plumbing. So you know how to put in a water heater. And then you get to watch the next water heater that goes out. You get to watch somebody that is licensed, be able to do it. And, and that is certified, be able to do that. And then you get to do it while they watch you. And then eventually you get signed off to do that. And if you sign off all the certifications for a service tech too, then we promote you and we give you more money. And that's worked out really, really well for us because I think that we have a lot less turnover because the people that had great work ethic that have been able to get promoted and have got, you know, they're thankful and they're more loyal. You know, sometimes you hire a trademan that does know everything, but two things happen. Once they're, they're not very loyal. So the next guy that offers them a dollar more per hour, they're gone. And then I would also tell you a lot of the people that have those skills, at least we have found aren't willing to do some of the intangibles and change their way. Like for example, our service techs are scored on experience too. Then who, like if your garbage disposal goes out, do you picture a really friendly person knocking on that door that knows how to fix everything? Of course you don't. You picture probably an old crabby guy right? That's there that just wants to get in and out. Well, that's not acceptable at our company. So we've also found like some of our core values, like unparalleled experience. Uh, it's a lot easier to be able to teach a lot of these skills, certify them, even pay for schooling uh, and, and different licenses to help our team members be able to grow. So that's actually, we haven't had any issues with hiring. It's kind of like this. If you think about it from this standpoint, I have a friend that owns a restaurant. He once came up to me, he's like, dude, we can't find help. Like we can't find help. That's what a lot of people say. And I go, I'm just curious, like, wh why? Like, what do you, he, he's like, well, nobody's applying for a position. I said, well, can, can you show me the job description and the responsibilities? Line number one said two to three years of waitress or waiter experience. I'm like, dude, 
Yeah. You were telling me why, like you're telling me if someone had a great <laughs> attitude and worked hard, you can't teach them how to read a menu and walk to the table and smile and then take the plate from the kitchen and set it nicely on the table. Like, why do they need two or three years of experience? And I think, you know, that's just the summation of my point, Axel. We've hired just a ton of people without that experience. And then we've given them that experience, which has created better retention, but also better results for us too. Absolutely. No. And, you know, I think a lot of folks in the hiring, right there, there's the two mindsets of you can either build talent or you can buy talent. Right. And I think maybe for different segments of a company, different approaches may make difference. Well, especially different segments of a company, but then also different trajectory or, or different components of a, of a company's life cycle as it relates to the trajectory and where it is in the growth cycle. Sometimes it makes sense to maybe try and buy talent if you're hiring for a position where there's an abundance of educated individuals with experience and it's not, you know, you're not having the problem that your friend's having with hiring the the waiter or the bartender or the waitress or whoever. And then sometimes as you're describing, right, if if it's challenging to hire skilled labor, you may just have to be the one to skill the labor. You may have to be the one to actually do that. Um you know, and, and sorry to cut you off. I would just say you're, you're exactly right. And what I have found is most people need to buy the talent when their training or processes suck. Yeah. And you need to buy a lot less talent when your training and your processes are really, really good. I mean, think about it for a second. It costs more and it's a lot harder to find an amazing person. Would you agree with that than an average person? Yeah, a hundred percent. So we like, I just think it's a lot easier if you want to scale a company to have above average or amazing processes than it is to buy a bunch of talents that's above average and amazing. Like if you build processes that an average person then can do and achieve elite results, it's much easier to scale. Yeah, without a doubt. Last thing before we switch topics here, you're clearly a very data oriented individual, right? And there's in, in clearly tracking all kinds of data, whether it's via scoreboards, whether it's related to property performance, internal performance of the team, et cetera. I'm sure you track dozens and dozens of KPIs. And I, I don't want to just ask a blanket question over this because it's, you know, we could probably do another two hours on that discussion. But uh, we talked about turning over units quickly, delivering a great product in a short period of time. Let's talk about the leasing side, which in my opinion is the other most critical component of the actual operations process. And and I'll, we'll try not to get uh, too verbose because I want to make sure I touch on one thing before I get you out of here. But Related to KPIs that you are reviewing on the leasing side of the business, um, whether this is a leasing agent going out there and leasing, whether there's somebody in a higher level management position overseeing a, a group of leasing agents, maybe just off the top of off your head, you know, kind of off the cuff, what are some of the most important things that you're tracking? Let's call it three KPIs that you find to be the most critical as it relates to evaluating the success of the leasing side. Um, of the house in terms of the property management sector. By the way, I was the first leasing agent in our company <laughs> for, a, for way too long. You got to yeah. know how to sell. So I guess the top three on just the leasing side, I would say would be occupancy rate. I love looking at the move in, move out trade outs report. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, most people know that on this call, but in particular, what I'm looking at is not just like the number, like last month uh, we had... I'm going to post this too. So I'm sure I'll butcher the numbers, but I think we had 197 people move out and 250, yeah, 251 move in. So we had a 54 count spread on more move ins than move outs, which is a company record. That's huge. Like anytime you can have more people moving in than moving out is a positive thing. But in particularly what we look at is obviously the loss gain to rent. So like if you had somebody move out for $1,000, but then the person that moved in, moved in for $1,400, that's a plus 400. So if you look at that, right, on 254 move-ins, what is the average trade-out number? And we're always tracking that because obviously our goal is to continue to run these properties better and give more value. And if you give more value, you should get more value. So I'd say that's for sure the, the second uh, biggest thing that I would look at. And I guess if I had to do a third, one of the things that we measure our leasing team on is for every good push goal, there's a pull goal. So then uh, we would track the amount of new people we put into a unit that leads to delinquency. So I think mm -hmm. it's a really important metric, right? So if you're looking at putting in a lot of people and then you're looking at, you know, anyone can put in a lot of people. I mean, we signed 212 leases in May. Well, that's great. But if you didn't do it 
by raising the trade outs, right. By putting in a higher rent, you gave too many discounts or, you know, you lower the rent, you get both of those in one or two, but what you don't get is like, you also just put in bad residents for a higher rent. So we also track with, I think we do, I think it's six months. So if you are a leasing agent and you put somebody in and for some reason it leads to delinquency eviction, whatever, within six months, you are actually penalized. And we actually like, it affects their incentives. So I, I take a look at how many we have and what that looks like. That's a great incentive structure, though, especially at, at the scale that you're operating at, right? Where you, I'm sure there's obviously a, a dozen plus leasing agents within the organization, whatever number it is, right? There's obviously a large number of them. And there has to be some over ownership over that five for 4,000 units. All right, well, I have to dig into this. So so five for 4,000 units is one per, you know, whatever that is, um, 800 or so units. Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? And then is, most folks would say that that's, a healthy ratio as it relates to, you know, one leasing agent can handle three, four, 500 units. You obviously have one per eight. Is that due to the consolidated nature of the portfolio at this point? You got a lot of units and a short, you know, small number of addresses, or are you doing some other things on the leasing side that allows one leasing agent to oversee such a large portion of the portfolio? Some of the reason that our results are elite, like we've never been above 1% in delinquency. We've always been really quick with service requests. Last month, we answered 5,300 phone calls and we only missed 24 of those by answering on the second ring. A lot of these metrics that are really, really elite is because we manage the properties by building out work streams of specialists and not generalist. So for example, if you have most leasing agents or most properties that have a hundred units have a property manager that also does leasing, right? But they also, you know, we expect them to be, by the way, these property managers, we expect them to be sales, right? Understand sales. We expect them to be legal experts doing delinquency. We expect them to coordinate with general contractors, do move outs, walk the property. Like we give them like 40 different things and expect them to be great at all of them. And that's a generalist. So at our company, nobody can do more than three things. So our leasing agents, that's all they do is sales, which is why they can do many more. Our service techs don't rehab units. They don't cut the grass. All they do is fix things. So our average service tech can do 500 units when the most average service techs can only do hundred at other companies. They can do 500. Like, so we, we have more units, but we mm -hmm. have less things for them to do, which creates expertise. So yeah, that's all they do. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say Axel, we do a ton of virtual movements. Like baby boomers aren't the number one renters anymore, right? It, it's, it's millennials, it's Gen X, Gen Z. A lot of these people that are moving in, they don't, the last thing they want is a leasing agent walking them through their units, selling them. All right. Yeah. What we do is, you know, we, we get great pictures. We usually stage the pictures so they can see what it's like. We pay for Matterports and we even get a video. So, I mean, on these Matterports, you can even measure the door frame. So, you know, if your king size bed can get in and, and then again, since we use literally the same rehabs, right? Like with very little variation, we can sell that to somebody without actually walking one, or they could walk a different one, you know, on a property nearby and be like, yeah, this is basically what your unit's going to look like. So I don't know, man, like I, I would say for sure over 90, maybe 95% of our move-ins never actually walk their unit that they're moving into. It's all done virtually. And that creates a lot of speed and allows our leasing agents to not have to go to the property and do these walkthroughs and do these things. Now, of course they will when the resident wants, but um, it's fascinating, man. Even our move-ins now. Move-ins used to be like all of 2023, they're all like in-person, on-site. Last month, I think it was, we we're for sure, again, like 98% selected virtual movements. Our renters want convenience. They don't want to be inconvenienced. So like come in and have somebody read you about your lease, or let's jump on a Google meets and I'm going to screen share with you, your apartment. I'm going to tell you where to park. I'm going to tell you where the laundry is. I can actually walk you through it. And you could do that from the comfortability of your car. I know you're, you got a U-Haul behind you. Like the last thing is you want to go sit down in an office and like me read you the lease. No, first of all, I can send you the actual video that I pre pre-recorded. I can allow you to ask me questions. We can just jump on a Google meet. I think we've done a good job adapting to some of the technology too, that has allowed us to be able to do more with less. Yeah, without a doubt. No, I mean, we leverage self showings and virtual movements in our business too. I mean, we, we don't operate nearly as many uh, units as you do. We're at about 600 right now, but, but we have one leasing agent for 600. She feels like she's getting stretched in. And a, a big reason is it's a, we have a scattered site portfolio of, of properties, um, you know, ranging from, from call it five to 30 units in size. So it's a little bit more of a challenge, but, but in general, it's important to leverage some level of tech in the leasing process, whether it's, right 
uh, answering preliminary questions, screening applications, actually working through the uh, the listing process, you know, getting photos taken for one unit type, and then using those same photos for the, all of those same, you know, similar unit types in the building and saving all that time. So you can, you know, put up as coming soon with the right photos, all that stuff. So that's, that's great. Last thing I want to touch on before we get you out of here. So 4,000 units plus, how do you think about holding versus selling versus you know, in terms of the business plan for a deal, are you somebody who wants to hold everything? How, you know, I'm sure you've sold properties over the years, but how do you think about it when you're grow as you're growing your portfolio? How do you think about actual from an investment thesis standpoint, the decision you're making as it relates to is this something I'm going to get in and out of? Is this something I want to hold forever, um, et cetera? I think just your general thought process around that's probably going to be helpful for folks. Yeah, that sounds good, Axel. I'm I'm a very very heavy buy and hold, so. Uh, I hold almost everything. I've I've sold almost nothing, and um, you know I still look at that sometimes. Like you know, I I mean I must have somewhere between 70, 80 duplexes yet because that's all I could afford when I was scaling up to to be able to buy. Um, so somebody would be like, "What, well, dude? You should just like sell those and then trade into something else." But I would tell you, just like you know, over time I look back at some of those, and um, since I don't have investors and I'm not really I don't really care about an IRR. Um, it's just really interesting to see how much appreciation and what inflation has done to some of those properties, like properties that I bought, you know, like we said, a decade ago are worth, you know, three to four times more. It's just, just nuts. And I'm bullish that I think real estate is going to continue right to appreciate like it has over the years. So I think if you hold it and you do it and you're confident that the property management company that you've hired um, and it's still your job to hold them accountable. You can, there's good third-party management companies out there. There really is. You just, you got to understand how to hold them accountable. So you need to understand a little bit about the processes and, and kind of create those with the third-party management company. But yeah, my best advice for the people listening is I would say, I think wealth is built through equity. And I think there's a reason that Warren Buffett always preaches hold, hold, hold. And same with Charlie Munger. And um, I think that equity growth, which is tax-free, by the way, is very, very valuable. And I think in the best, one of the coolest things about real estate is that you don't need to sell the asset to be able to reap some of the benefits, right, of that, you know, changing in value. You know, today I actually did three refis um, just before this. And I was able to pull out three and a half million dollars worth of money tax-free. Like, why would I sell it? The property still yeah. cash flows. My debt service credit ratio is after refis a 1.3. My LTV is like a 64% still. Like the, the asset still cash flows. I just pulled out three and a half million dollars worth of money. And so now I get this reoccurring cash flow, all the appreciation that comes with it later. I have access to money to be able to buy other deals. To me, because of the opportunity to refi this asset, maybe for me, I would have had to sell properties to scale if there wasn't a thing called the refi, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there's no way to pull out all that money that you're putting into it. But I think real estate has so many benefits just for holding it. And of course, I'd be remiss if I said there, there's a lot of ways to be able to scale. And I'm sure my you know, cash on cash or IR percentages could look differently if I would get, get in and get out. But Every decision that I make in a property when I acquire it is to give value to the people that are going to be there before I take it and then understand that I am going to die with this property. So I think it just makes me create better decisions around quality and the standards that we want to do too. Love it, man. That's great. All right, last, truly last one here. What's what's next for you? Do you have some goals here over the next few years? I mean, you're obviously, you you, you own and operate a massive portfolio. You have a, a large business, both on the management side and the construction side, overseeing all of this. You've probably put yourself in a position where you're working on really what you enjoy working on would be my assumption at this point. Um, is the goal to keep growing the portfolio to, to do something else? What are the next few years for you look like? It's a great question. So I think from, uh, there's a few different goals, like from a management standpoint, I'm probably most upset with like, how do we kind of disrupt this industry and, and provide incredible value for the people that, um, rent with us. So really making sure that we do things like not just cutting the grass, but like, let's edge it, let's landscape it, let's fertilize it. Let's, let's, uh, not just do work orders, but let's do it in 24 to 48 hours. Like, like change the industry by creating like an Amazon like speed and a Disney world, like details on experience. And, um, so that I'm really proud of what I own, um, I guess is the best way to say that. So like, I think that's important. And I think the people that pay good rent deserve that. And it makes sense. So from a property management company, I still think we got a long ways to go to give residents the experience speed and overall standards that they deserve and really focused on that with my president right now. 
And then I've acquired a couple other businesses or like, you know, minority equity stakes uh, in businesses. So uh, I joined a hard money lender out of Nashville and a couple others. And I'm really enjoying that too. So just like, I don't run the business. I don't want to... <laughs> building a business and you got enough on your plate man jesus yeah. yeah and it's just really hard this is so i don't yeah. want to run a business anymore but i do find a lot of value in giving strategic you know direction or you know helping with complicated maybe people issues and and process issues and if i can just do that a little bit that and then own a stake of equity in that company i think that that's exciting. And then my wife and I are working on a foundation. So working on how do we give out free education, you know, creating programs for people that may have not like me, like didn't understand how to achieve financial freedom or don't understand how to get into real estate. And we're buying homes and we're renovate, renovating homes and then giving it to a family at a 0% mortgage interest. So I think that's a big part of the foundation and just some stuff like that. And you know, my biggest goal now, like Axel, to be honest with you, is like, I got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old and I am having a freaking blast, like coaching them. Like I'm coaching them in basketball and soccer. And so I'm looking forward to spending a lot more time with them as well, too. That's fantastic, man. No, this, I mean, this is all great. I think, um, first of all, the idea of buying, renovating homes and selling off at zero percent with 0% interest rates is that's a, that's a, that's a, such a great direct way to have an impact on a community. Um, especially now <laughs> where it is becoming so incredibly challenging to get into home ownership for so many folks, um, whole nother topic for another podcast, but I, I just really admire that, that initiative, that objective. Cause I think that's, it, you know, obviously any type of philanthropy is obviously helpful and, 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 and impactful, but that is something that has such a direct immediate impact on somebody's life that you can truly see as well and measure. That's, that's really interesting. I think that's a great, uh, a great initiative. Logan, this has been a killer episode, man. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I personally learned a ton here. I'm sure everyone listening learns even more. Um, where can folks reach out to you if they want to connect with you or, or learn more about what you guys got going on? Yeah, you can check out my website, just loganrankin.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well, too. It's just comment if you guys want to know anything. And, you know, um, my best advice is there's, there's like, there's a lot of, lot of ways to be able to make money in real estate. So like, do whatever you're passionate with. I don't want to turn anyone, like if you're great at raising money and, you can hold a third party management company accountable. Like I, I think there's a lot of wealth to be made that way too, but you gotta, you gotta take a few risks and take a few chances. But the number one thing you're going to have to do is if you really want to create substantial wealth is when you buy that asset, when you buy that business, you know, sure. I've done creative financing and, and structured debt a little bit differently and stuff like that in the past, but the number one way I've been able to scale and um, that I recommend for everybody, you still got to understand how to operate the real estate. You still got to be able to take the business that you bought on day one, and figure out how to make the business more valuable. And the difference between what you bought it for and the value that you created is how you're going to create the most amount of wealth. It's not just like buying it and then selling it in a couple of years and moving up rents 50 bucks. So that's like my best advice overall today. Love it. That, I mean, again, incredible episodes. Um, we'll link to, to Logan's website in the show notes. Um, but again, thanks for the time, man. This has been a killer episode.